Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 1.47 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon. It's in the high 30s, Fahrenheit temperature, sunny skies out there. And we will begin session B of our live stream series at the top of the hour, about 13 minutes from now. So I'm going to take some time and say hi to everybody. Uh, make sure we're okay with the technology. A couple of thank yous. And uh, then we will begin at the top of the hour. Of course, if you're watching this in replay, you can go ahead and scrub ahead. You don't have to watch this first part if you don't want to. So, I'm so glad you're with us. Let's see if we're uh, doing okay here. And if you've already typed in where you're viewing from, I'll have to ask you to do that again, I guess. Uh, hi, Bruce in Vancouver, Washington, and Shannon. Come on, let me get this over here. Hi, Todd, geologically speaking. Actually, no, let, me, let, me, let me pop the chat out like a boss. That's just how I roll. We have almost 200 here already. That's terrific to see. Uh, Elf in Odensee, Denmark. Saber's laptop is warming up. Good to know, Saber. Ver, uh, Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, Donna's in Ellensburg, Washington. Heard of it. Calgary, Alberta. Scrolling way too fast now to keep track of what's going on. You know what? I'm going to come back here a little bit. Uh, Mankato, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota. San Antonio, Texas. Edmonds, uh, Washington. Kamloops, BC. Hi, Joan. Uh, Selma, Oregon. San Felipe, Baja, Mexico. Hello. Clyde Park, Montana. Abbotsford, BC. Odensee, Denmark. Already read that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Roberts in Calgary. Kathy is in Brisbane. Have a good one. Uh, Bris Brisa Vegas or something. Pishaston, that's Ron. Uh, Redmond, Washington. Auburn, Washington. Jason, the drone guy in uh, Wenatchee. Hi, Jason. Uh, some of these people you've seen on, on camera uh, with videos we did this summer, for instance. Uh, where am I now? Uh, Regine is in Cordemanche, France. Elaine's in Tucson, Arizona. Hotel Papa 100. Reinfeld in Switzerland. What's up, homie? Uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Hamlin, Germany. So, yeah, this is, this is we're approaching 2 p.m. Pacific. And so I know for the Europeans, it's quite late. Vincent's in Montreal. Uh, I wanted to do this in part to uh, give other people a chance to see us, like if you're in Australia or New Zealand or the other side of the globe. I didn't really do the math, but I thought maybe this would work for you. Who knows? Napa, Oregon, the K is silent. Oh, God, I did it right, Matt. Nice. Sharon, the Malaga slide. Hi, Sharon. Um, Sharon was instrumental in uh, setting things up with Randy at Stimult Spires. Randy, Randy Lewis. Vinman's Bakery, that's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Wallacey, UK. Okay, yeah, we got more than 300 already. That's, that's terrific. Now, um, let me give you a chance. Let me just, let me take a break here. Let me give you a chance. I mean, you don't have to, but I guess you can copy down the outline. I don't know. And while you're doing that, um, again, you don't have to take notes. Uh, do I have my, can you hear this thump, thump, thump? I'm going to call this Lappy. This is my lapel microphone. I hereby declare from this point forward, this is Lappy, the microphone. Lapel mic, otherwise known as Lappy. Are you hearing thump, thump of Lappy? Okay, good. Thank you. Just a little insider information. Did you see session A? Lappy was not engaged at all. I had sound, but it was... So, Lappy. I've been practicing. So, 
Yes. Picture looks pretty good to me. Looks pretty smooth. I've done a little practicing since I saw you last on Saturday. I will say hi to a few more folks and then I do want to do a couple of thank yous. So I'll keep this laptop here. Um, Papa Gino. Uh, Elaine, hello. Lorraine. Other people that rhyme with that name? I don't know. Peter, hello. Uh, hi, Patrick. So Patrick is here, age eight. Patrick, are you here? Great if you are. Are you out of school? Yeah, I suppose your school isn't open again today. Grand Forks, North Dakota. Darrington, Washington. That's backcountry Gary. Hi, Gary. Uh, Tamara. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is a storeroom door over there. And uh, yeah, so you don't have to worry about anybody coming in. That, that's just a closet. Hey, Patrick, it's good to see you again. I know that you were with us yesterday, or last time too, right? And you had to leave a little early. So I'm glad you're with us, Patrick. Uh, Dennis said in Dorset, UK, Kent's in Jackson, Louisiana. Big hugs from Joe Slick Live on Twitch. Thank you, Joe. Uh, lots of highs to Patrick. That's wonderful. San Diego, there's Oscar. Oh, we do have some regulars here. But if you are new to us, I want you to feel welcome. And I'll save some of that till we start. Garrett the Dutch Night Owl from the Netherlands. Okay, um, a verbal thank you. Uh, some of you are, are veterans of what I've been doing from this lecture hall. In other words, you remember last winter with 101 and last spring with 351. Uh, I'll make this short. Uh, there's a guy named Clint from Florida, and he drove from Florida to Ellensburg in August or maybe July and showed up and didn't really say he was from Florida or anything, but he said, I wanted to sit in on your class this fall. I didn't really have the context. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. Got to wear a mask. He's like, that's fine. So Clint said, I want, while I'm here, I want to do the class. I want to do the lab. I want to you know, join you in the field if you do any of those pop-up things. And he did. And at the beginning of the 101 this fall, which I'm not live streaming, but if you remember the 101s from winter possibly, there's something called the Yellow Book. It's a little $10 pack of, of diagrams. And uh, every student is required to buy one. And so I'll finish to the end of the story. Uh, a few days ago, we did our second midterm in 101, and Clint had been in that seat right there in the way back every day. And got, he's, I don't know what, how old he is, late 30s, mid 40s, not sure. But he got to know all the students in his, uh, in his area there. And uh, I got a little note slipped under my door uh, a few days ago. And it was a note from Clint saying, thank you for the experience. Um, I wanted to wait until now to let you know I was the guy that bought all the yellow books for the students at the beginning of the class, but I didn't want them to know that. I didn't want them to treat me differently. And here's some more generosity so you can buy yellow books for the next five years. <laughs> so Clint uh, is from Florida, didn't want to stick around for all the snow, which is forecast. So he's on his way to another destination and just continuing his travels, hopefully in warmer climates. So, Thank you, Clint, coast to coast. If you see Clint coast to coast in here, that's the Clint I'm talking about. And uh, thank you very much, Clint. Hope you're okay with me sharing that story. And the other thank you, we still have four minutes. Is that some of you have seen the pop-up geology events. I did four of them this summer. They're live events where I announce on the YouTube channel here uh, that I'm going to be at a certain place out in the middle of nowhere, and here's the day, and here's the time, and the weather looks good, and I'll bring a camp chair, and I'll do a live lecture. So those, those were recorded, and they're on my YouTube channel if you want to see them. 
But the most recent one I did was maybe a month ago, I kind of forget. And it was down at uh, a place called Mary Hill. And we were set up at a, a replica of Stonehenge, weirdly, looking south across the Columbia to Oregon. And I threw into that uh, Mary Hill Stonehenge live stream, yeah, live stream and pop-up geology with a group of, I don't know, 200 or people sitting there. I was talking about the Biggs Junction Jasper, the picture, the Biggs picture Jasper. I even forget the proper way to say it. And I said, I don't have one to show you, everybody, but you can collect some of this Biggs Jasper, this picture Jasper, and you can work it into jewelry or a bolo tie or something else, and it's really handsome, but I don't have anything to show you. So, of course, not of course, but Tom and Cindy from Hayfork, California. Beautiful note. Um, basically, Tom and his dad back in the 1970s collected some of that big picture Jasper, brought it back to their place in Northern California, and Tom has had this piece of Biggs, Biggs Picture Jasper uh, for 50 years. And he said, I want you to have your own piece of Biggs Picture Jasper. And so I do. And I wish I had my document camera ready to use today, but I don't. So I'll just have to show you kind of this, even though the focus is maybe not great. So thank you, Tom and Cindy, for the gift. I will use it next time I talk about Biggs Picture Jasper. Okay, I got a couple minutes to get my head right, I do believe. Uh, we're up to uh, almost 600. I'll say one more thing. I think there's a chance I am also live broadcasting on Facebook for the first time. I think I selected, you know what, let me go over to, I have another window open here. Am I not? I don't think it worked. Oh, scheduled to live video in 20 minutes. Anyway, I don't know. I may be broadcasting on Facebook Live. I have no idea if there's any way for the Facebook people to like type into our live chat on YouTube here. As long as it doesn't crash the system, I, I don't care. So that might be a little wrinkle. That's the only real new wrinkle. And I'll save the rest of my comments for you. need to give me one minute, if you would, please. Would you give me one minute? I need to get my head right, and we will begin our session. Thank you for joining us. Hot mic. Don't swear, boy. Don't say anything bad now. You're walking around in an empty room. There's no reason to swear, boy. Don't swear. Don't you dare swear. Pleasant good afternoon to you all. Thank you for joining us. This is session B of a series of live streams titled The Crazy Eocene. That crazy Eocene, that's our topic, not only today, but through the entire alphabet, 26 shows. We've already done one. Session A was Saturday, Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And here we are, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time for Session B. So that is the schedule. Saturday mornings at 9, Wednesday afternoons at 2 Pacific time. And we'll work our way through the alphabet and we'll work our way through the winter. 
I want to say a few programming things before we begin. First of all, if you are new to us, you might be surprised there's so many people watching here. And you know what? I'm, I'm starting to get nervous. The chat was covered up, and I'm going to ask real quick. I've got a little bit of a delay on one of the laptops for some reason, so would you mind? Um, are we okay? Are we five by five? Thank you. Okay, so if you're new to us, you are certainly welcome to be with us. And we have people of all ages, all backgrounds, some hardcore geologists, like professional geologists, retired and actually research working uh, geologists, uh, teachers, um, people who are majoring in geology, people who are thinking of majoring in geology, people who have no interest in geology and they just like being here. It just seems like a healthy place to be. Seems like a warm, welcoming community. I think that you'll see that in the live chat. So we've already kind of had this going for uh, almost two years now. And um, so for all those reasons, we continue with these live streams. I do want to say, I keep turning, pointing to that, why? I don't know. This alphabet series has a plan to it. And I, I did this in the first session, session A. I want to do it quickly again real, um, um, before I forget about it. I'm, from this point forward, I'm going to assume that you've seen the previous letters in this crazy Eocene A to Z series. That's going to save me a lot of time. I don't want to go back and say, oh, if you had the chance to see uh, show D, and here we are and show D. I just, I'm just going to go with the working assumption that you're, you're in. You're in on this alphabet series, and you know that each of these letters builds on the next. Okay. But I think it's wrong of me to assume that you've seen anything before that. We did an alphabet series, A through Z, a year ago, and it was called the Exotic Terrain Series. And if we go to the magic time stick, which uh, we were using out in my backyard last year, uh, we had all of our, almost all of our work last fall with the Exotic A to Z series, the Exotic Terrains A to Z series, last fall, we were confined to a time window between 200 and 50 million years ago. And that was a time frame where we were bringing in exotic terrains. So to finish my thought, I think it's inappropriate for me to just go, well, obviously, with exotic terrain, show T, we talked about such and such, the Alexander terrain and this and that. Uh, hell, I don't remember most of that stuff. <laughs> I, I'm the one that did it. So I, if I do refer back to some of this exotic material from a year ago, kind of what we're doing today, I must say, uh, I'll make sure you're kind of uh, swept into this, that, that you're not totally cold. But the Eocene thing will be, I'll, I'll just assume you're on board there, even though I hate that phrase. Okay, have you noticed that I added some blue? And the blue, as we said in session A, of course you all remember session A, we said our time window this time, this winter, is between 60 and 40. That's not technically the beginning and end of the uh, Eocene epoch, but that's close enough. So this blue is our crazy Eocene, and it is a crazy Eocene. There's an incredible amount of stuff going on during the Eocene. Okay, so what is our outline here? As, as I try to organize these sessions, and I'm trying to keep them to an hour, we'll see if I'm successful. There's typically three acts, and let me try to describe this before it goes away. The title of this is The Main Events. Now, that's confusing right off the bat. I don't know what kind of story we're talking about, but if you're doing a story, uh, you say the main event. That's a singular thing. That's a phrase talking about the main event, right? So why am I making it plural? Well, well that's, the, that's the architecture of session B. Let me explain. Last spring, when I was teaching Geology 351, I was using the phrase, the main event. And it was an event that happened 50 million years ago. So all those Geology 351 sessions, we were building up to and then studying and then realizing the aftermath 
of the main event that have to f happened 50 million years ago. So if you only saw 351 last spring, like six months ago, that was the main event, singular. Again, if you were with us a year ago doing all this food prop stuff from home and the exotic terrain series, that's where I first stumbled into the phrase, the main event, and I wasn't talking about 50, I was talking about a main event that happened 100 million years ago. So I have used the phrase, the main event, to talk about two completely sep sep uh, uh, separate events, separated by 50 million years. They're nice round numbers. So I'm, before I forget, I want to ask you right now, I'm going to need some help from you today, some creative help, no geology training necessary. I'm looking for a pet name for these two main events or some kind of clever analogy for these two main events, assuming you don't haven't you know, haven't heard about them yet, I'll, I'll describe what those main events are. But I'd like you to think about possibly helping me now or later on or even after the fact, leaving a comment down below. I don't want it to be too cute, but I, 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 I don't want it to... We'll, we'll be talking about these two. There's three of them, but it's really these two that are going to be the, the linchpin, uh, the linchpins of our entire winter. It's a big theme. I don't know exactly how we're working through the alphabet this winter. In fact, I don't know hardly at all about how we're going to use the rest of the alphabet this winter. But I do know this is going to keep coming up, and I don't want to say uh, main event one or the main event that happened in the mid-Cretaceous. Too many words. The main event that happened 50 million years ago in the Eocene. Too many words. And maybe we won't come up with something. Maybe I will have to say that. But... This is an important thing to lay out visually. And if you're like, oh boy, is this, okay, is this just a, like a review of last year? Like, I saw all of those. Are you just doing, re recycling the same stuff? Are you out of new stuff, bro? The answer is no. So I am committed to having new ideas in every one of these winter letter series, including this one. I've got a spin or two on this that I think will be something we can hang our hat on throughout the rest of the winter. Uh, that was my introduction. 766 people. Well, no, I'm not. Uh, one more thing with my introduction. After we, um, so, so that's my request for you. Now or later, coming up with some kind of clever way to describe that, once you hear about it. Um, we are talking about the exotic terrains as a collection. I used to teach that the exotic terrains came in and accreted to the edge of North America one at a time. I would literally say one at a time. You remember session A, I talked about, or I showed my old school way of talking about how the Rocky Mountains formed, which I no longer use because it's wrong. But I, I would use that phrase of these terrains are coming in one at a time, one at a time. That's wrong, that's wrong. Instead, these terrains came in with three major chapters. Each major chapter called a main event, <laughs> or, or whatever your phrase is. Here are the dates. Main event one, 170 million years ago. Main event two, 100 million years ago. Main event three, 50 million years ago. Again, if you're a, if you're a hardcore folk with us, you, you already know what I'm leading to here. But you haven't heard my new twist that may um, set the table for us for the rest of the month at least. And this is really my new um, contribution to us this morning. And I'm, I'm real excited to share it with you. It's going to be graphic. It's going to be a graphic thing. It's going to be graphic. Doc and slice. I've never had that phrase before. I don't know if I'll keep it. But for right now, that's my thought. With each of these three main events... We are docking something big, and after it docks, we're going to slice it in half. 
And I didn't quite see it that way, that, that, that simply, until the last 48 hours. Okay, I think it's going away. I'll keep it kind of over here within plain sight. Uh, but that is our plan today, at least part, part of it in plain sight, I guess. Uh, it's just you and me and the chalkboard. Um, I do have some bells and whistles coming, but uh, they are not ready for prime time yet, and I'm not ready for prime time to handle them yet. So I want it to be as simple as possible where it's just you and me and a chalkboard today. Okay? Um, okay. So... We are talking about exotic terrains. And I'm holding them up to the camera. This is Big Smooth, by the way. That's my new nickname for this camera. This is the smoothest camera I have. It's not choppy, it's not jumpy, at least I don't think it is. I hope it's not. It's all Big Smooth. I'm just holding stuff up to Big Smooth. So everything in green here are exotic terrains, pieces of land that were either formed in the ocean and added or are parts of North America that got shifted somehow and moved. But the main point is once we go between brown and green, we go from old North America with a passive margin, meaning there's an old west coast of that uh, old North America for hundreds of millions of years. And then everything in green was accreted, was added. Everything in green on that map, this is review. Between 250 million years ago is where we're bringing all these green things in. But what does the outline say? Each green, each exotic terrain did not come in one at a time. Did not come in one at a time. It's not a simple story of lining these gumdrops up here in the water. So if we're talking about the fact that we didn't have any of these exotic terrains here 200 million years ago, and that's true, we didn't have any of these terrains accreted to the edge of North America 200 million years ago, and by 50 they're all here, let's get away from this idea that they're all lined up like some sort of Easter parade, and here come the floats one after another. Ooh. Maybe I don't need you. Float? Parade? Hmm. So, again, for a long time, I would say we have subduction of some sort of ocean plate. I don't even know the name of it. Maybe Farallon, maybe not. And as we keep scraping off each of these exotic terrains and adding it to the edge of North America, then we just make more land for North America. And the more land is all this accreted exotic terrain material. Okay, we are not accepting that today. According to the outline, we're crossing out one at a time. And instead, we're bringing in clusters of exotic terrains together. These are individual exotic terrains. But there is something called a super terrain, where you have three or four or five or two, take your pick, a bunch of these individual exotic terrains that, I'll, I'll draw it for you, I'm not afraid to draw. Let's do a map. So this is a side view, this is a cross section, this is a view looking down from heaven. Here's North America drifting generally to the west. Here's a bunch of exotic terrains on a map looking down. Okay. And if this ocean floor is moving, and therefore moving these guys, you've already heard my point about 17 times. We're not just bringing these guys in and adding them on one at a time. We have evidence, and it's good evidence. And the totality of that evidence is not going to be clear maybe for a while. It's not actually clear in my brain, but we do have good evidence. 
that we get some of those individual terrains to hook up out in the ocean and make a super terrain. That says super terrain. And then this super terrain, or this super baked potato, where they have hooked up out in the ocean, then we add that. Okay, I'm spitballing right off the bat, but I'm going to go to one of the big points of today. What are the dates? I don't have it for you. What are the dates for the three main events? 170 million years ago, 100 million years ago, and 50 million years ago. I was going to hold off on this. I'm going to do it now. The centerpiece, the pit, the nucleus, however you want to say it, for those three super terrains, or those three main events, is something called an oceanic plateau. I couldn't hold it. I was going to build and build and build. Screw that. I couldn't hold it. I'll say it two more times. If you're following me, that there's a concept that these did not come in one at a time, but it's more common than not that they gather together out in the water and then come in as an amalgamated hunk. What? That's fine. Super terrain, as you can clearly read. But the centerpiece is an oceanic plateau. There's, there's a core. I don't want to use core. That's kind of confusing. But one of these is kind of the nucleus of this super terrain. And you're like, wait, are there, are there three main events? Yeah, there are. In the last 200 million years of adding terrains to the west coast of North America, there are three major chapters of adding. Yeah, three super terrains. Am I saying there were three different oceanic plateaus? And I am. And by the time we're done to act three, I don't even know which act we're in now. I think I've done all three acts at the same time. By the time we're done today, we will see that it's these ocean plateaus in the guts of each of these super terrain accretions that's going to dock and get sliced and cut in half. What did I say? Dock and slice? Yeah. Dock and slice. Dock and slice. Dock and slice. That's three docks and slices. Okay, are we okay? Um, you're like, I guess, but I think I need to see some stuff. Okay. Don't have the document, ready, document cam ready for you. But I've got old Mappy McMap from the backyard. Memories. Last fall, we were slowly coloring this thing, show after show, adding another color, carefully selecting a color. And now looking at this, each this is Alaska, Yukon Territory, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, blah, blah, blah. You're like, what's going on here? Why is this all white? Some of you know that. Why, why didn't you color in Oregon and southern Washington? What's the answer? I'll wait. delay. I think I'll wait. Why don't I have colors in Oregon more than I do? Are there no exotic terrains there? Yes. CRB, German chocolate cake. The first six letters of the alphabet last year with the exotic terrain series, we were talking about reasons that we were limited in our exotic terrain knowledge. Because things like all this brown which is flood basalt material that flowed over the surface of this map roughly 16 million years ago, long after the terrains have been accreted. We have no idea which terrains are beneath 
that stuff. And this is just one example of many complications. So that's why when you look at Mappy McMap, you see colors, plenty of colors making up the entire province of British Columbia, plenty of colors in Alaska and Yukon. But a lot of the white here, it's going to take me a while to get re un unreversed here. Sorry about the weird hands, weird fingers. This is all under the German chocolate cake, the flood basalts. And there's other reasons we have problems down here. Okay. So we know these didn't come in one at a time. And so what you're looking at, here's another goal for today. Can I somehow help you see three major chapters with all of these colors? And before I try to go there with you, I feel I need to pause. Boy, I'm really loosey-goosey today. I think I have to tell you why we're spending time on exotic terrains today. I think I do. Because again, I'm really talking about this time between 250. Our three main events are happening during the red bar, the last main event coming in at 50. And this winter, including this, uh, this session, I guess, we're talking about blue. So why am I even down here? I'm confused, you say. I guess you're going to have to trust me, number one. But a more satisfying answer to that question, why are we bothering with going backwards in time to pre-Eocene? How do I say it? We're going to, and here's where your analogy needs to be really helpful. I'm going to try to do it a couple ways. Okay, I like this. I like this. You know that an oceanic plateau is involved in all three of these main events. And I'll tell you right now that next time I see you for a live stream, which will be when? Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. We, we go every Wednesday at 2 and every Saturday at 9, 9 a.m. So I've decided we're going to do a full session on uh, oceanic plateaus on Saturday. Might have a special guest with us, live. But your analogy for our three main events have to involve these big oceanic plateaus. And I'm going to put you off until Saturday if you have certain questions about these things. I'm going to have a whole show devoted to why these things formed, why we think they formed, where they were originally, that sort of thing. But for today's session B, we're just... We're given these, these three big chocolate gumdrops out in the ocean. And you can see the dimensions. These oceanic plateaus are, it's a German chocolate cake in the ocean. Ooh. It's a German chocolate cake that's like soaked in salt water. That's not going to taste good. They are flood basalts. I don't want to say any more, and I'll wait till Saturday on, on more of that. But your analogy is the main events are these things are going to hit us. <laughs> they're not in the ocean anymore. They're, on, they're, they're here. Some of these colors are the... I'm, I'm excited now. Some of these exotic terrains are the actual... Actually, are they actual... Oceanic German chocolate cakes. Like, I don't know how nimble you are, but like, do you know which of the terrains we talked about last fall, just off the top of your head, were almost 100% massive amounts of flood basalt? You probably have one in your mind, maybe two. I don't know if you have the third one, though. Okay? So, to finish my thought there, I am a little scattered, but I'm having fun. Hope you are too. We're going to take an oceanic plateau, which is not a minor amount of basalt. We're going to have it hit North America. And all hell, is, sorry Patrick, all hell is going to break loose inland of where this thing slams into us. 
Now that's going to be challenging for your analogy. That's why I've struggled myself. Okay, we got some, something from the ocean coming and hitting our shore, fine. But then there's this just absolute havoc, this absolute everything goes berserk uh, 500 miles inland from the coast because of this thing hitting us. Like it just sets off all these bells and whistles. Well, I'm, I'm doing the work for you now. I got, I got to slow down. <laughs> I'm, what sets off all sorts of bells and whistles? What, like at a, at a county fair or a circus? And it's like, boom, and then blah, 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 blah. There was a boom, blah, 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 in the Eocene. But there was a boom, blah, 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 blah. maybe I've got it. 50, 50 million years before that. And there was a boom, blah, 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 70 million years before that. 170 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 50 million years ago. Those are the three main events. <laughs> All right. Maybe that's the goal. Maybe we have a live stream where I don't speak one word of English, and it's just sound effects the whole hour. <laughs> Okay, I do have to collect my thoughts. Oh, yeah, okay, I, I know what I want to do. So let me give you, now that we know these two views and we know generally what we're talking about, uh, I don't want to save this. this. This is garbage. Let's be a little bit more specific with the exotic terrain names that we learned last fall to build... Western North America. And I'm going to go very quick with this because, again, we've already done it last fall. And I'm not going to just you know, stretch this all out into four live streams this winter because all those shows exist in replay from last fall. Okay, it's going to go quick. I'm mostly going to build British Columbia because British Columbia is... Um, the easiest place to study exotic terrains because they don't have near the flood basalts and other things that we have. They have some interruptions, but you can see more of the terrains in British Columbia. Uh, I'm just doing it in cross-section. So here's North America. Just going to take up the whole page here. Page? North America. Old North America. And the old passive margin, the old coastline, uh, I am going to use a little tiny town uh, on our side of the border, yeah, even though we're building British Columbia. I, so Kettle Falls. Kettle Falls, Washington is a river town today. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not that the Columbia River is flowing on this old boundary, but it is. Boundary between what? Boundary between old North America and the rest of the exotic terrain. So Kettle Falls, I have on the map. So we're going to build all these colors quickly. We're going to build all these colors quickly just along this transect, but we're really talking about the entire margin, more or less, today, as simply as possible. OK, you ready? Main event one. Three terrains come in as a super terrain. They hook up out in the ocean and they get added 170 million years ago. Now, students, I'm not saying that these three exotic terrains I'm about to draw have rocks that are 170 million years ago, right? This date is the date of the first main event and it's the date when we add those terrains. That's different than the age of creating the terrains in all three of those guys. Okay, so you can probably do this as long with me. Uh, many of you can already kind of write this out for me. This is Quinellia, exotic terrain. This is Cache Creek, exotic terrain. This is Stachinia, Exotic terrain. You're like, slow down. I don't know anything about that. You got work to do. There's a, there's a live stream for each of these 
last fall in the exotic terrains A to Z. Now, what was our new theme, our new idea, one of our new ideas today? The nucleus, I'll say it, the core, no, I won't. I don't, core is the Earth's core, totally different. The pit, <laughs> you got a better word than I do. The centerpiece, I like that. The centerpiece of this super terrain, which, by the way, is called the insular super terrain, insular. The centerpiece is Cache Creek. I need another color, a color that's actually going to show up. Orange, will it show up? Disappointing. I'll just do white. Why am I circling Cache Creek? Many think Cache Creek had a major foundation that looked like this. Now, I've got an I've got a, uh, email into Mitch Mahalanek. You might remember that name from last year. I haven't bugged him in a year, but I'm back. I sent an email off early this morning. And maybe I'll hear from Mitch before Saturday's show. But I basically asked Mitch, I'm getting hints that Cache Creek has an oceanic plateau uh, centerpiece. I guess I'll say that. I guess I did say that. Is that true, Mitch? Have you mapped enough? That's a dumb question. Mitch is a British Columbia geologist who's mapped all these terrains and has contributed more than anybody, as far as I can tell, to all these colors and what the colors look like in, in British Columbia and the Yukon. I think that's right. I think he's the lead guy. He's my age, I think, maybe a little older. But uh, I don't know, and I'll get clarification from Mitch possibly, do we truly have a Cache Creek basement or is mostly Cache Creek an oceanic plateau story? And you're like, wait a minute, I thought you said you had a Cache Creek show last, last fall. I did. But if you recall, I was mostly focused in Cache Creek stuff on the limestones that were on top of this oceanic plateau. Cache Creek I'm talking about. And there were things called Tethian fossils. Do you remember that now? And that the Tethian fossils indicated a Southeast Pacific origin. As far as I can tell, that's the only evidence for getting Cache Creek originally on the other side of the old Pacific. So out of our three main events, I have the least detail for you today. I might have more by Saturday. But I want to move on. Here's what I mean. Three guys coming in, not one at a time, right? coming in as a super terrain called the insular super terrain, adding 170 million years ago, and suddenly our coastline in Washington, which used to be Kettle Falls, this was ocean before the insular came in, now our coastline is at Tenasket. Oh, no, that's wrong. I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember because it, it, nobody knows. So I, do, I, I just made an error because I do remember that Tenasket is a little town in the Okanagan that's on the west coast of Blue, and the Blue is the Quinellia. God dang, i got to do this. The, blue, the royal Blue is Quinellia. Here's Cache Creek, Grello. Here's Stakinia, light blue, Dodger blue, I believe. So here's our insular, light blue, grello, dark blue, light blue, grello, dark blue, coming in together 170 million years ago. But the error I made is that Tenasket is not on the west coast of the insular, and nobody really knows a town in Washington, at least, that's on the west edge of the insular because, oh man, I made a boo-boo. Did you catch it 15 minutes ago? Brownie, hats off to you if you caught the error. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. This is not 
the superterrain called the insular. This is the superterrain called the intermontane. The intermontane superterrain. I'm sorry. Now, you're probably more forgiving than the 19 year olds who are usually in the room with me. If that happens, I'm proud to say it doesn't happen that often, but there's probably two or three times in a quarter where I go 15 minutes without catching my error, and then I go, oh, hey, I'm sorry. And they go, uh, 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 super dramatic, you know. It's like, come on, you, you got an eraser. Intermontane, three guys coming in, centerpiece of the Intermontane superterrain, Cache Creek, Intermontane superterrain, adding 170. Okay, moving on. Am I forgiven? What's the next date for a main event? We're now to main event two. This is the first main event. Centerpiece, Cache Creek, Oceanic Plateau. Uh, less satisfying because we really have just two terrains instead of a nice little uh, mirror image. But what's our date? Yeah, 100 million. There's a lot of stuff in the North Cascades. that fits into a very broad story from Alaska to Mexico, and that date is becoming a big deal. And I was at a big G GSA session led by Basil Tikoff from University of Wisconsin the whole morning. I don't know how many talks there were. 15 talks, all centered around the 100 million year event. And most of the talks, they were presenting their stuff from God knows where, and they had no region. It was clear they had no regional context of that. Like they knew it was happening in their county in Utah, and that was about it. It felt like. By the end of the session, in other words, late morning, Basil gives the last talk, and he's like, "Look, all this stuff's happening up and down the West Coast 100 million years ago. What do you think happened?" And I like that. And full disclosure, he's been emailing me a little bit back and forth. We might have him at some point live with us on screen during one of these live sessions. I hope so. But there's a lot going on 100 million years ago. That is the accretion, sorry about jumping the gun one last time, of the insular superterrain. Which is the Alexander exotic terrain and very important, so I'll write it out. Probably the most famous exotic terrain of them all. Famous because it, it was one of the first. Carefully studied 50 years ago. So Rangelia and Alexander together are the insular super terrain. These guys got together out in the ocean, just like I drew before, and they accrete 100 million years ago. How's the analogy coming along? I'll be real interested in reading your comments and seeing who's got some good ideas. But I remind you, we have two of our three main events that have already happened. And again, there's a centerpiece of an oceanic plateau. Well, hold on. I don't see, I don't see a nice centerpiece here. I just see two terrains. That's you talking. I'm like, yeah, sorry about that. We don't have a perfect, uh, identical look. But Rangelia is the oceanic plateau. So I, I think I need to. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna barcode us up here. Solid yellow on this little cross section indicates oceanic plateau. So is Rangelia, the oceanic plateau, centered? No. But it makes up a considerable share. The Rangelia plateau I'm talking about now, the Rangelia oceanic plateau, that is the centerpiece. Now I don't like my term because it's not perfectly centered. But there's a hell of a lot of exposure on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, flood basalts, 
of Rangelia Oceanic Plateau. I'm going to do something more with that, but let me move on. We got one more main event, right? And it's probably the third and youngest main event that you probably all guessed, or many of you know what's coming. So I'll do it real quick. We got one more. Here's our dates, right? Just on the outline. Here's our, here's our dates. Our th it's not one at a time. It's not one at a time. Cluster, boom. Cluster, boom. And this thing is not really a cluster. The whole thing is a German chocolate cake under the ocean water. It's called Celestia. When did that accrete? 50 million years ago. Oh, you want to be centered? Fifty million years ago, centered perfectly in our blue target window for the crazy Eocene A to Z series. I'll go one step further. Things go apeshit in the Eocene, sorry Patrick, because Celestia hits us. And because it's the youngest of the three main events, we have the most... Um, we have the best preservation of all the crazy stuff that happened. Boop, 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 bing, 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 bing. All these things happening, yes, as far east as the Rocky Mountains. Stuff's happening as far east as the Rocky Mountains because of this thing adding in the far west. That's the far-reaching implications of these main events. And like in most things in geology, we know the most about the recent events because they're freshest, quote-unquote. If you want to call 50 million years fresh, <laughs> you know, there's just less erosion, there's less stuff covering, less chances to cover things up. And so that's why there's no problem stretching out. That's the wrong phrase. We, there's no problem talking about Eocene for 26 shows. And we're not going to screw around. We're going to get into the Eocene and all the Celestia related stuff sooner than later. I'm, I'm not going to wait until January for that. There's too much good stuff to cover. Now, I feel compelled to give you a little bit more. These are the accretion dates. So this is almost a little sneak peek to Saturday. These are the accretion dates, but we do, do we know the age that the German, the Celestia German chocolate cake was built off of the ocean floor? We do. And these piles of basalt pile up remarkably fast. I'm not saying it as well as I want to. I'll practice before Saturday morning at, at 9 a.m. But this is flood basalt stuff. This is outpouring of mafic magma with incredible volumes. And my point is, these ocean plateaus are built from scratch on the ocean floor within a five million year time window. Five. And to emphasize that point, I'm going to fudge just a little bit. Fudge, German chocolate cake. Whoops, I'm good. I'm going to keep these dates. Technically, there's a little bit of younger building of the Celestia, younger than 51, but let's, let's keep a nice, simple story. We're going to build the Celestia Oceanic Plateau between 56 and 51 million years ago. Some of you know, already know the story about why, but that's Saturday. That's Celestia, and these are the dates that we built the ocean plateau, and here's the date that it got added. Like, we build the thing, and before we know it, it's added. However, 
we've got the same five million year time frame, a short time frame to build such a crazy big and wide oceanic plateau, Rangelia. Is that 56 to 51? It is not. When was the Rangelia Oceanic Plateau built? Eddie better check his notes, but I think that's right. Yep. That's back in the Mesozoic. That's during the Triassic. So Rangelia, we can visualize, I think, more coming on Saturday, we can visualize Rangelia being a similar sized German chocolate cake underwater. But that's where the similarities end, because this thing was built so much earlier, Triassic. We're building the Rangelia terrain here. But it's not till 100 million years ago that things get added. And now, maybe I'll hear from Mitch Mahalanek, British Columbia geologist. If not, maybe Jerome Lessman or somebody else from BC might have a little bit more for me. If there is a ton of flood basalt in Cache Creek, I don't, I, th I think I read it's Triassic also. But I, so I'll, for just simplicity, let me make up some phony numbers. Is it possible that the ocean plateau that probably was the basement of Cache Creek, Grello, was also built at this time? I don't want to get crazy. Now, it's not, is it possible that Cache Creek was part of Rangelia out in the water and then they got split up somehow and half of it got added? That's too advanced. Probably shouldn't even have said that. So I need to dig down and see if we do have good data. Number one for Saturday, is there really a bunch of Cache Creek flood basalt? That may not be true, but I think I've read that in a few places. If it is a bunch of flood basalt that makes up Cache Creek, then what's the age? Is it identical to Rangelia or older or younger? But apparently it's Triassic roughly in age. And who cares? Well, that's coming in the, our last little act, which is about to begin. I see David Newton saying, nope, wrong place. But I think what you're saying, David, is there's some terrains in between Cache Creek and Rangelia, but I think we, we've got plenty of time to do all sorts of crazy geometries out in the Pacific, can't we? I don't think we can rule out. Anyway, um, let's... While I've got this here, we have one more little chapter. I don't think it'll take forever, but we're on, we're on schedule. I hope you're enjoying this. How many have we got? We're approaching 1,000 on a work day. Pretty good. I did notice that the Saturday morning live stream, we had 1,000 people with us live, kind of like we do now. And there were an additional 9,000 that watched session A between Saturday morning and now. So that is terrific. And the pressure's on. Can I keep people coming back to these? Can I maintain those numbers just because they w did session A work? Will they come back? or not. Doesn't matter really, but I'm curious if, if, if I can keep people going through the whole alphabet. I'll be curious to see if we can do that. Um, just verbally, let me emphasize a, a, a thought that occurred to me as I was sitting staring into space last night after I had a nice beer. Another way to emphasize the exotic nature of these colors is thinking about ethnicity. Be careful, boy. Place of origin. I kind of did this last fall, but yellow is Alexander terrain. And the main message from the Alexander terrain, which is part of the insular super terrain, by the way, right here, is it came from Northern Europe. So this yellow guy is an immigrant from Scotland, from Russia, from Norway, from the UK in general, and here, arriving on our shores, quote-unquote. 
Cache Creek, as I just mentioned, Grello, is from Indonesia. Well, we're back to the Parade of Nations in the Olympics, I guess. I always love watching that. They're all marching in. If it's a different language, they're not in the order of the English alphabets. <laughs> I never know what's next. You probably do. So in Indo or Southeast Pacific, or we can just say Indonesia. Here, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia. And they come in with the placard and then a few uh, good-looking athletes, all fit and everything, waving. Cell phones. Cash Creek. Rangelia, I can't hold it. Rangelia, from the country of Ecuador. You want more information? I'll see you Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. Not for sure, but there's an idea out there that Rangelia was built at this time at the equator. Now I'm giving all the good stuff away from Saturday. Why did I do that? Dumb. And there's some Mexican things in here as well. Okay, good. Last act. Saturday, we're going to look at the distribution of these oceanic plateaus. Every orange blotch on the global map is a different German chocolate cake underwater. That's coming on Saturday. But here, and I'll keep this for a little while here for you. I love the simplicity of this. And you know that there's a bunch of orange there. There's some light orange and some dark orange, right? What's the dark orange? Ocean plateau material. Is it in the ocean anymore? No, it's not. When did the Cache Creek stuff come in? 170. When did the Rangelia stuff come in and dock? Main event number two, 100 million years ago. Where's Seletsi? It's not on this. But why are these ocean plateaus skinny little worms on this map? Why aren't they one big hunk? What's the answer to that? I think I might wait for that as well. Here's the question again. If we have a Cache Creek Oceanic Plateau and a Rangeli Oceanic Plateau, why do they look like worms? Why don't they look like circles? Compression, maybe, Neil? Uh, Richard, sorry. Aha. S. Gujul. Letha Lee. Sean's remembering the outline as well as Frank. Dock and slice. Dock and slice. Let me give you the concept on another chalkboard, and then I'll show you some real maps, and then we'll quit. And we'll go to your live question and answers. I like this one. I hope the AV is working okay, but I like this one. Okay, here's the concept. And we're, again, we're going to use this a fair amount. This is not just session B, and then we forget about it. I'm, I'm really setting us up for uh, some themes and some concepts, especially if we have a catchy analogy or a pet name or two, uh, this is going to keep coming back and help us. Even when we're into February, it's going to help us. Um, okay? I'll do the same thing I did uh, before. I'll do a cross-section and a map. We'll see if that works. So this is the cross-section, obviously. A continent of North America drifting generally west. This is not a seamount. This is not some little spreading ridge. This is a gargantuan oceanic plateau that is over-thickened oceanic crust. More on Saturday. More on Saturday. This is normal ocean crust. This is thickened ocean crust both off the ocean floor, but also apparently geophysically we know that it's thicker in the subsurface as well. 
Now, a map view of that, let's add a concept. So this is a map. We're looking down from heaven, right? And let's have North America. Let's not worry about the actual plate. Actual. Let's not actually worry about the, the true plate vector or the true cardinal direction or, or lack thereof of North America. Let's just let's leave an arrow off that. But I'm slowing down. Can we please take this oceanic plateau? This is this. And you're like, which one? Which one? Hold it. Which one? Cash Creek? Which one? Rangelia? Which one? Seletia? I'm saying all of them. I'm saying this is just a cartoon. I'm trying to demonstrate our dock and slice visual. We haven't docked this yet. We haven't docked this yet. This is the ocean water. We can, we can see this through the waves of the Pacific. And here's the coast of North America's continent. But what, can we please do this? Can we please, just for fun, have an ocean plate that's not coming at North America head on? Which has historically been the way to go. It's the simplest thing for our minds. I'm guilty of it most of my career. East, west, north, south, north, south, east, west. Like it's just, it's just pleasant to do it. Again, using the cardinal directions. But we really want to hammer this idea of an oblique collision. It's going to take us a while to get used to this idea of an oblique collision and also why it's such an important theme for us this winter in the Eocene. But what I mean, I'll, I'll write it. Um, I think I tried to hit this pretty hard a year ago, especially towards the end. Uh, late in the alphabet, last December. I don't know how successful I was. But this guy, Basil Tikoff, I mentioned. Okay, I'm going to brag just for a second, okay? And then I promise we'll finish. I'm normally just doing my stuff, and I don't really have much intersection with the research world, with the people who have all the funding and the cachet and the decades of important scientific work. I don't usually intersect with those worlds, but I have been lately, because many of these cats have been seeing what I've been up to here. And Basil in particular, and Stacia Gordon, and Daryl Cowan, you know that name, Paul Umhofer, a few others. Yeah, I'm name dropping right now. But some of them at least, Daryl for sure, but maybe Basil and Stacia saw enough of what we were doing late in the alphabet before Christmas that they kind of got their juices flowing again, and they put a proposal together for something called a Penrose Conference that was going to get all the experts together that have been working on this idea of oblique subduction about 100 million years ago. And it was denied because it was a last minute proposal right before Christmas, plus there's some other stuff we don't need to get into, but they're reproposing. Basil just checked in with me this week, Basil Tikoff, and said, hey, you, you can be part of this thing again? You, 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 you partly inspired this whole thing. You want to do the public outreach for that as well? I'm like, sure, you bet. That would be an honor to be part of that group. So that's another reason that I'm hitting this oblique subduction hard, because potentially in 2023 or whatever, if this thing gets funded, there'll be a big leap forward in these concepts during the mid-Cretaceous when we have this 100 million year event. OK, I'm done bragging now. Did it feel like a brag? Dock and slice. What does it look like when you move our oceanic plateau with the moving ocean plate that's subducting obliquely, but who cares? It's just coming in like this right now. What does it look like? Does this thing go down the tubes? Probably not. It's so thick. 
How about this? Does this work for you? This could be Cache Creek. This could be Rangelia. This could be Silesia. Any of those three main events, this is one of the effects, after effects, bells and whistles going off, potentially. There's debate about this. And we'll obviously go back to this a bunch this winter. But we're bringing this in from the side. Now, my real question is, on a map view, let's do the same thing. I don't have animations for you. Maybe I will if this Penrose thing gets funded. That's a thought. Let's bring this in. I'm going to try to go fast because I'm not going to draw it very well, probably. Same idea. We're bringing this in. You know what we're doing, right? I'm hitting a, a press play on the green chalkboard, and now this animation starts. And this... this um, I don't have anything that here. Okay, so we're looking down at our oceanic plateau. It's moving. It's moving. Maybe North America's coming at it too, but I don't care. We're just, it's relative now. We're moving this thing in. Dock, this is the big moment of today, one of them. Dock the oceanic plateau. That's easy. It doesn't go down the tubes because of the cross-section I just showed you. It gets stuck. Maybe the slab fails down below North America. That's for another day. But the docking of the oceanic plateau is step one. Dock and what? Because of the oblique nature of this oceanic plate that was bringing this giant cake to us, this waterlogged oceanic plateau. Hey, Jeff, whip one of those up at the bakery. Make a German chocolate cake and douse it in salt water, please, by Saturday. The thing comes, it's a gift. But because of the plate vectors and the overall stress regime, let's not get into it, are three guys. Who are they? Cash Creek 170, Rangelia 100, Silesia 50. I think all three of them get docked, get sliced in half. Let's make it nice and easy. And half of this thing gets sent north off of the board. Dock and slice. And you're like, are you sure? Well, I have two scientific papers waiting for you at my website. And maybe at the very end of live q and I'll be bold enough to try to share my screen. It probably won't work. I haven't had much luck lately. But even if I crash the system, NickZentner.com, in the upper right-hand corner is the word Eocene, and if you click on that word Eocene, upper right of NickZentner.com homepage, I'm going to have some key scientific papers waiting for you. And there's two right there right now. And one of those papers has a diagram that really caught my eye. And I know this is when I was drinking a beer. Because for the first 10 minutes of looking at this diagram, I like, oh, I like the simplicity of that. And for the first 10 minutes, with a buzz, I thought I was looking at Silesia. But you can read as well as I. This ain't Silesia. This is Rangelia. Everything in black are parts of the Rangelia German chocolate cake underwater. 
Part of it is on Vancouver Island. Part of it is on Hata Gwaii, formerly known as Queen Charlotte Island. Half of it is here. I don't know what that is. A bunch of it's up in Alaska. And in yellow, highlighted for you, are strike slip faults. And again, if you're like, oh man, you were really building for something, this looks kind of disappointing. This isn't Seletsia and Yakutat. It looks exactly like it, though. That's what gave me the biggest charge since Saturday. Finding this paper, finding this diagram, and going, my God, this is a carbon copy, old timers. This is a carbon copy of exactly what it looks like when you dock Seletsia on the Olympic Peninsula, which is not here, 50 million years ago. You cut it in half. The half that went north to Alaska is called Yakutat. That's what Aaron Donaghy is working on, former, uh, current student of Mike Eddy from Purdue University. And if you're willing to be still with me here, this is 100 million years ago, dock and slice. I don't know the timing on the slicing, by the way, but the docking is 100. Is it possible that the first main event, Cache Creek, which docks 170 million years ago, was also docked and sliced? What do you think's the first thing I did when I had that thought? I went to Mappy McMap. A map that I colored. So before I show you Mappy McMap, what colors Cache Creek? Grello. There's Cache Creek, the town of Williams Lake is in the middle of Cache Creek. I still have to confirm this, but I'm teaching you today that Cache Creek is mostly a flood basalt story that was accreted 170 million years ago. Dock and slice. Is it possible that that used to be down here? Just like that used to be down here. I'm not 100% sure. And Mitch and others have been mapping up here. I know they have strike slip faults bounding most of these terrains, but has anybody, it is a common knowledge, or has anybody taken this piece of Cache Creek up at Atlin, extreme north British Columbia, Atlin, British Columbia, where there's some Cache Creek North. Hey, there's a person in here called Cache Creek North. Are you from Atlin? Is it possible your Cache Creek was down here next to the rest of Cache Creek when Cache Creek flood basalt German chocolate cake docked before it got sliced? I don't know. And then the last thing I'll say which is another loose end for Saturday morning, and I might learn from Mitch or Jerome Lessman at Vancouver Island University. I might learn from you. I might learn from somebody in the live chat. I might learn from somebody sending me an email. But I purposely avoided this guy, partly because I don't know how to say it, and Gayacham, let's say. That also is flood basalt. I don't know the dates on Engayam Chai. I don't know the accretion dates or if it might be part of Cache Creek or Rangeli or something else. So I think you know by now this is my favorite thing to do, maybe out of all this stuff, all the field videos and the interviews and everything else. I think my absolute favorite is connecting some dots between things. Bonus points if nobody's tried to connect the dots before. It just hasn't occurred to them to make some, make some 
uh, connections. And I'm in a position to do that because I'm trying to think about how to package this for a general audience. The danger is if you're a research person and you are very rigid and tied into a certain set of papers and ideas, then typically you don't value somebody like me because I haven't done any <laughs> detailed work on some mountain range or whatever. So, you know, I'm just a teacher and, you know, I don't think you know your stuff, says this person. And that's totally reasonable. I would be exactly the same way. I'm confident of that. I'd be the same way if I saw me doing this and me spending 35 years with my boots on the ground cranking out papers with a research community or a mapping community. I'd be the same way, I think. But that's okay. I have enough people who are seeing what I'm doing and are fond of it, even those hardcore people. And I think that brings me the most pleasure out of everything is that maybe offering a couple of ideas about potential correlations or connections that nobody's ever really said out loud. Maybe they've said kind of off the record between friends, you know, at dinner or something, but to put it in print is kind of a big leap for many people and their reputation is not at stake. Well, my reputation is, isn't at stake for anything because of how I set this whole thing up. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, sure. I enjoyed this one. Uh, let me uh, look at some uppercase questions. Uh, and I, I just feel like I need to check. It. Is, is this really happening on Facebook or not? Is it not? I don't see anything. I guess not. All right. I was just curious. Okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm seeing a bunch of uppercase. Thanks for the questions. I'll try a few here. One one rotary power. Is dock and slice a Baja BC mechanism? That's an interesting question. I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to stay disciplined. We will get back into Baja BC a little bit, but only at strategic times. And Baja BC is done by the Eocene. So I guess it'll be sooner than later now that I say that out loud. But yes... Yes. Mount Stewart, Doctor. No, no. <laughs> Let me think about it. Generally, yes, but to give you some specifics, well, shit, right? Okay, I'll save that. We'll do a Baja BC show. Thank you for that thought provoking and also confusing question. Confusing in a good way. Slim Jans, how do the terrains fuse to the North American plate? Uh, I get that question a fair amount. Uh, and I've never had a great way to answer it, so I'm not going to have a great answer for you, not have a satisfying answer to you. You know, I've tried quest answers like uh, there's a bunch of oceanic crust material that gets caught between these terrains when they come in, and so they kind of like act as glue, and that doesn't really work. And then you talk, kind of talk about a compressional regime, so everything's under a squeezing pressure anyway, so of course they're going to stay together. Is that how you're saying it? How do they fuse together? Uh, another way is maybe on a smaller scale, you just have certain faults that are like thrust faults. And so if you shove one terrain up on top of another, that's kind of a way to fuse them together, quote unquote. Um, wish I had a better answer for you. Patrick, age eight, has the new stuff you've been learning and thinking about, like oblique subduction, that a boy, Patrick, changed any of your thoughts about Baja BC? Okay, so Patrick and Rotary Power are thinking about Baja BC. Yes, Patrick, thanks for the question. I didn't even think about that, but maybe many of you that know about Baja BC, and if you don't, I guess, again, you'll have to go back to the older series for now. But I guess I didn't anticipate you guys looking at that and thinking immediately Baja BC, because look at this thing. It's way farther north than it used to be. But of course, that's a concept that is needed. Yeah, it's needed for Baja BC. Now the question is timing, among plenty of other things, but Merle Beck, who watches these, and I hear from regularly, where did he do some of his paleomag work that was the centerpiece of a lot of the discussion? Rangalia, baby. 
him and Ted Irving and Davy Jones and others. Papageno, I'm sorry, the device nine. Are all three events composed of flood basalt at heart then or just Silesia? Well, you know that I lump. So if you really go back and look at the Rangelia live stream or the Cache Creek live stream or even the Silesia live stream, it's not truly 100% basalt. There's some sedimentary interbeds. There's some volcanic arc stuff that pops up here and there. You know, so I'm kind of a lumper, meaning that I'm just painting a picture of a simple German chocolate cake with nothing else going on. So with that said, um, so let's see, is essentially 100% flood basalt. Rangelia is mostly, and maybe not 100% flood basalt. And then we're back to Cache Creek, which I, I just need better information about Cache Creek. If there's not a ton of flood basalt in the Cache Creek terrain, why are people talking about it being an oceanic plateau? Is it just the fact that you've got shallow water limestone in the southwest Pacific and there's no way to have shallow water limestone of that acreage unless you have an oceanic plateau sitting underneath it? Is that why you think it's an oceanic plateau, Mitch? Uh, Catherine's having a blast. Uh, thank you for, uh, you never know how these are going over. I am too. Uh, Papageno, did the BC and Alaska sections of Rangelia dock at the same time? Did the BC and Alaska, I don't know that. Wait, dock? Yes, I'm saying, you're asking about Rangelia, right? Yeah, I'm saying that everything that's in black docked 100 million years ago, and it docked down here. Actually, do I know where it docked? I don't know where it docked. It may have docked further south. That's an interesting question. But if you're asking about the, did this stuff all dock at the same time, I'm saying that, 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 and that were all together as an oceanic plateau in the water, and they all docked at the same time, yes. And they're not together now because of all this strike-slip motion, not just on one yellow fault, but maybe a couple of others to explain that. I'm still not live. I'm just kind of creeping my way forward here. What are the, uh, the Dave, what are the areas between the OPS? Between the OPS. I may not know what you're talking about here. Between the OPS. I'm going to have to skip. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what that means. OPS. Between the Oceania Plateaus is just plain old basalt ocean floor, if that's what you meant. Uh, Jerome wants to talk about Baja BC. Um, oh, this is really helpful. One of, one of the reasons to do live Q&A is I can see what people are interested in, and that informs kind of how we go for the next few letters. If I have a bunch of Baja BC people asking, um, then we should definitely dive back into it. I wasn't planning on doing more than maybe one show, but maybe I'll do more. Thank you for that. I'm down to live. I, I'm, I'm screwed around here now. I'm, I'm down to live, and I'm scrolling back again a little bit. Kevin, is the Western North America extension due to the overrunning of the East Pacific rise? Thanks for the question, Kevin. If you're talking about the extension that I was mentioning with session A, Kevin, is that the extension you're talking about? If it is, in session A, I, that was the biggest moment from session A, talking about that there's all this weird stuff in the Eocene where everything's extending as opposed to squeezing. But that's 50. That's the most recent main event. And there's extension all over the place. Pluton's coming up. Metamorphic core complexes with upper plates sliding away, and so on, and so on, and so on. All sorts of extension 50 million years ago. Now, maybe you don't mean that, and Kevin, maybe you do mean that if Silesia added 50 and created a bunch of extension inland of that, 
Maybe, Kevin, you're saying, why wouldn't that be the case 100 million years too? Why wouldn't you accrete Rangelia and have a bunch of extension then? That's a payoff for hitting this main event repeat thing. We know the most about accreting Celestia and having all these bells and whiffles going off from 50. That could work. Why couldn't we then have the next show bring in what we know about Rangelia? I'm still not sure where it docked, by the way. And then is there ways to find all sorts of extension 100 million years ago? But East Pacific Rise, no. East Pacific Rise is way too young for either of those, slipping beneath North America. Thanks for the question. Kent, can zirconium dating tie the slices together? The zircons that are collected in rocks are one way to piece things together, yes, before they are sliced and moved. But basalt is famous for not having many zircons to work with. So if our centerpieces of oceanic plateau, if we're mostly dealing with basalt, and I think we are with Rangeli and Celestia, you've got to be creative looking for zircons, and that's what this student Aaron Donaghy has been doing, looking for sandstones above and below. Jim, where is the oceanic fault at this time? Oceanic fault. Not sure what you mean. Oceanic fault. Um, the faults we have talked about today have just been brief, and they have been yellow lines that are uh, strike slip faults that are not really out in the oceans. If you happen to be referring to these, this is truly where the oceanic fault is today and still active, still making earthquakes. This is the Queen Charlotte Fault. But there are many other faults that are active today, of course, the San Andreas. But if you're not talking about that, I'm not sure what you're mentioning or what you're referring to. Thank you. I'm going to scroll back a little bit more. We'll do a few more. It's almost, we knew I wasn't going to keep these to an hour, right? Arthur, would any of the scraped off material roll or invert? I don't know about rolling, and again, some of, I keep saying again, I'm sorry, I don't, it's repetitive. These are rare times when we have a huge, like these are the size of Texas and bigger, size of Alaska coming in. So it's hard to imagine these ocean plateaus docking and then doing much, really. What did you say, tip and roll or something? Roll and invert. But a smaller terrain, sure, why couldn't we do some of that gymnastics? You're fine, Kevin. Yeah, it's, it's hard to keep these things straight. That's a common error that, a common error that I make too. There's all these concepts and without carefully, without carefully keeping a time stick uh, chained to your brain, it's easy to just visualize everything happening at the same time. That's easiest for us, right? And that was actually the point of session A last fall, the exotic series. I spent the whole time just saying, we have to eliminate these topics because they're too young. We have to eliminate these topics because they're too old. And I think we're doing the same thing here. Yes, most of our attention is this winter is going to be at the youngest main event. But if I keep referring to Rangeli, I'm, I'm like way out of this already. So yes, it's easy to jumble those stories and have them all happen at the same time. Does uh, Zig, does this rule out Karen Siglock's thoughts? I don't think so. And I may involve Karen somehow. Karen was the gal who was doing what appears to be revolutionary work in the lower mantle and finding slabs of ocean crust. Notice that I'm not real careful about what the name of a certain plate is that's subducting or the angle of subduction or because I think that's still very difficult to reconstruct and won't be a main focus 
But I, I don't see why we just shut the door on car and stuff. It certainly shouldn't. Scrolling down to live, we'll do three more. I really appreciate you being here. We still have over 800 on a Wednesday afternoon. Cosmic J, the five PDF files have gone from your Eocene link. Coming back later or change of plan? Those were just placeholders, Cosmic J. And those five, among many others, still exist if you click on 351. So those five are just some from 351 that I copied and drug over. So they're still there. There's no shortage of science papers. Uh, if you go to Nick Zentner, I'm about to share my screen, I think. These live streams this winter, every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Every Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can, you can bank on that. I'll probably take a break for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but otherwise, you can bank on those until we get to Z. Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific. Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Two more. Uh, Torsten, does some of the oceanic plateau subduct? Uh, probably. Um, I don't know if, well, yes and no, I would say. Again, there's many different cartoons you can draw. This is just one of them, but I like it for a number of reasons we'll talk about later. But, uh, so is it subducting? Well, kind of, like it's, it's, it's not just kissing at the shore. It, it is being driven underneath some of the continental crust of North America, but I think it's generally viewed that these things are so thick and maybe buoyant, especially Solecia, which is so young. Like this stuff is so warm. It, it was just made. Remember, we don't have that anymore. So... I don't think it's being sent down to Karin Siglock land, if that's what you're asking. Two more. This is fun. Sometimes before we start, I go, why do I do this? I get all nervous. And, and then I do it, and it's like, oh, this is a blast. This is really fun. And part of the fun is it's new stuff and new thoughts. Jamie and Heather Ballou. Hello, you guys. Can we define the mechanism that can bring exotic terrains from as far as Scotland, Tethys Sea? Does it fit under continental drift or plate tectonics? James Earl Ballou. Well, clarification first of all. Alexander terrain came from Scotland, but that's not the Tethys Sea, I don't think. This is a former student, Jamie Ballou. It's Jamie, I'm being nitpicky, I guess, but as I visualize it, the Tethy Sea and the Tethian fossils are talking about the South Pacific. So to me, you're mixing up Tethian Sea and Scotland in the same question. But what you're really asking is, are we talking about continental drift or plate tectonics? And I think we have to be talking about plate tectonics. Therefore, we have to be talking about moving ocean plates as these conveyor belts. We're not getting away from that. We're not getting away from moving ocean crust, carrying stuff through the ocean, for sure. That has to be the mechanism. But to reconstruct actual plate names, and this plate looked like this at this time and was moving in this direction at this time, I mean, you, you can lose your mind reading those papers. Every map, just the cool of plate. Google Kula Plate, Google Image Kula Plate, and you'll get 30 different world maps at 30 different times in our past, and the Kula Plate will look different in every map. You could even pick one time. What did the Kula Plate look like 60 million years ago? And you'd have seven different maps of different... <laughs> it's maddening. And it's because most of the stuff's gone. One more. Um, Dean. Edmondson, does data of current North American tectonic plate vectors support the inferred displacement of multiple chunks of exotic terrain so far to the Arctic? Infer, does it support inferred displacement of multiple chunks? I might have your question. I might, I might understand your question. First off, this is a foreign land to me. I don't even really know the terrains that are up there. 
Second of all, all of my attention has been down here. And I really haven't even looked at any wild, I was just talking about Kula Plate craziness. I, you know, Spencer Fuston from Houston and other papers have reconstructions of ocean plates up there. But am I really getting at the heart of your question? You're saying by looking at the current North American motion, does that support inferred displacement of multiple chunks so far north to the Arctic? I guess yes, in that sense, if I'm getting you correctly. Like, like the vectors we have today work with rather impressive amounts of northward translation. I'll finish with that. Yeah, I guess I'm finishing with Baja BC. Ted Irving in particular sounds like it was a real character. He's passed away, but I learned about Ted Irving, uh, who lived on Vancouver Island, from Merle Beck. They were the old paleomag boys who were putting this whole thing together in Baja, B.C. and all that. And apparently, maybe I'm making this up, but apparently Ted at one time, or maybe regularly with almost everybody he would talk to, friends and foes in this Baja, B.C. debate, he would basically say, can you, can you believe people are arguing against this Baja, B.C. thing? Look at how much obvious northward movement we have today, like recently. Like in the last 20, 30 million years. Take just reconstructing the piercing points on the San Andreas Fault. How can this be a crazy idea when we have it going on now, basically, is what he's saying. And that's maybe kind of what you're saying. And so my answer is, what I know and what I think those folks know up there is that we have this rather fast northward motion of certain terrains now and so why wouldn't we, why would we just automatically rule out more than a thousand kilometers northward translation during Baja BC time? Oh boy, I guess we are doing Baja BC. A toast to you. No, I need eye contact. A toast to you. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of your parents, Patrick, and your grandparents, Patrick, and also for everybody else. Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents. And the health and well-being of our children and our grandchildren and our friends and our neighbors. I sincerely thank you for joining us for session B. You want to see it one more time? And there are some loose ends to follow through on, terrible grammar. And if this concept of an oceanic plateau being the centerpiece of these main events has grabbed your attention, then both you and I are going to do some learning uh, within the next few days. And I want to answer questions like, why are those oceanic plateaus out there? Why are they building so quickly? If we know that, where exactly in the Pacific was Rangelia created? Where exactly in the Pacific was Cache Creek created? We know exactly where Siletia was created. Those questions and many more related to oceanic plateaus will be addressed Saturday morning 9 a.m. Pacific. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. End stream. End stream.